This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hunter Quartermain's Story by H. Ryder Haggard Sir Henry Curtis, as everybody acquainted with him knows, is one of the most hospitable men on earth. It was in the course of the enjoyment of his hospitality at his place in Yorkshire the other day that I heard the haunting story which I am now about to transcribe. Many of those who read it will no doubt have heard some of the strange rumours that are flying about to the effect that Sir Henry Curtis and his friend Captain Good, R.N., recently found a vast treasure of diamonds out in the heart of Africa, supposed to have been hidden by the Egyptians or King Solomon or some other antique people. I first saw the matter alluded to in a paragraph in one of the society papers the day before I started for Yorkshire to pay my visit to Curtis, and arrived, needless to say, burning with curiosity, for there is something very fascinating to the mind in the idea of hidden treasure. When I reached the hall I at once asked Curtis about it, and he did not deny the truth of the story, but on my pressing him to tell it he would not, nor would Captain Good, who was also staying in the house. "'You would not believe me if I did,' Sir Henry said, with one of the hearty laughs which seemed to come right out of his great lungs. "'You must wait till Hunter Quartermain comes. He will arrive here from Africa to-night, and I am not going to say a word about the matter, or good either, until he turns up. Quartermain was with us all through. He has known about the business for years and years, and if it had not been for him, we should not have been here to-day. I am going to meet him presently.' I could not get a word more out of him, nor could anybody else. Though we were all dying of curiosity, especially some of the ladies, I shall never forget how they looked in the drawing-room before dinner when Captain Good produced a great rough diamond, weighing fifty carats or more, and told them that he had many larger than that. If ever I saw curiosity and envy printed on fair faces, I saw them then. It was just at this moment that the door was opened and Mr. Allan Quartermain announced, whereupon Good put the diamond into his pocket and sprang at a little man who limped shyly into the room, convoyed by Sir Henry Curtis himself. "'Here he is, good, safe and sound,' said Sir Henry gleefully. "'Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you one of the oldest hunters and the very best shot in Africa, who has killed more elephants and lions than any other man alive.' Everybody turned and stared politely at the curious-looking little lame man, and though his size was insignificant, he was quite worth staring at. He had short grizzled hair, which stood about an inch above his head like the bristles of a bush, gentle brown eyes that seemed to notice everything, and a withered face, tanned to the colour of mahogany from exposure to the weather. He spoke, too, when he returned Good's enthusiastic greeting with a curious little accent which made his speech noticeable. It so happened that I sat next to Mr. Allan Quartermain at dinner, and of course did my best to draw him, but he was not to be drawn. He admitted that he had recently been on a long journey into the interior of Africa with Sir Henry Curtis and Captain Good, and that they had found treasure, and then politely turned the subject, and began to ask me questions about England, where he had never been before, that is, since he came to years of discretion. Of course I did not find this very interesting, and so cast about for some means to bring the conversation round again. Now we were dining in an oak-panelled vestibule, and on the wall opposite to me were fixed two gigantic elephant tusks, and under them a pair of buffalo horns, very rough and knotted, showing that they came off an old bull, and having the tip of one horn split and chipped. I noticed that Hunter Quartermain's eyes kept glancing at these trophies, and took an occasion to ask him if he knew anything about them. "'I ought to,' he answered, with a little laugh. "'The elephant to which those tusks belonged tore one of our party right in two about eighteen months ago, and as for the buffalo horns, they were nearly my death, and were the end of a servant of mine to whom I was much attached. I gave them to Sir Henry, when he left Natal some months ago.' and Mr. Quartermain sighed, and turned to answer a question from the lady whom he had taken down to dinner, and who, needless to say, was also employed in trying to pump him about the diamonds. Indeed, all around the table there was a simmer of scarcely suppressed excitement, which, when the servants had left the room, could no longer be restrained. 
"'Now, Mr. Quartermain,' said the lady next to him, "'we have been kept in an agony of suspense by Sir Henry and Captain Good, "'who have persistently refused to tell us a word of this story "'about the hidden treasure till you came, "'and we simply can bear it no longer, so please begin at once.' "'Yes,' said everybody, "'go on, please.' Hunter Quartermain glanced around the table apprehensively. He did not seem to appreciate finding himself the object of so much curiosity. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' he said at last, with a shake of his grizzled head, "'I am very sorry to disappoint you, but I cannot do it. It is this way. At the request of Sir Henry and Captain Good, I have written down a true and plain account of King Solomon's mines and how we found them so you will soon be able to learn all about that wonderful adventure for yourselves. But until then I will say nothing about it, not from any wish to disappoint your curiosity or to make myself important, but simply because the whole story partakes so much of the marvellous that I am afraid to tell it in a piecemeal, hasty fashion, for I fear I should be set down as one of those common fellows of whom there are so many in my profession." who are not ashamed to narrate things they have not seen and even to tell wonderful stories about wild animals they have never killed and i think that my companions in adventure sir henry curtis and captain good will bear me out in what i say yes quartermain i think you are quite right said sir henry precisely the same considerations have forced good and myself to hold our tongues we did not wish to be bracketed with well with other famous travellers there was a murmur of disappointment at these announcements. "'I believe you are all hoaxing us,' said the young lady next to Mr. Quartermain rather sharply. "'Believe me,' answered the old hunter, with a quaint courtesy of a little bow of his grizzled head. "'Though I have lived all my life in the wilderness and among savages, I have neither the heart nor the want of manners to wish to deceive one so lovely.' whereat the young lady, who was pretty, looked appeased. "'This is very dreadful,' I broke in. "'We ask for bread, and you give us a stone, Mr. Quartermain. "'The least that you can do is tell us the story of the tusks "'opposite the buffalo horns underneath. "'We won't let you off with less.' "'I am but a poor storyteller,' put in the old hunter. "'But if you will forgive my want of skill, I shall be happy to tell you not the story of the tusk, for that is part of the history of our journey to King Solomon's mines, but that of the buffalo horns beneath them, which is now ten years old. Bravo, Quartermain, said Sir Henry. We shall all be delighted. Fire away. Fill up your glass first. The little man did as he was bid, took a sip of claret, and began. About ten years ago, I was hunting in the far interior of Africa, at a place called Getgera, not a great way from the Kobe River. I had with me four native servants, namely, a driver and vorloper, or leader, who were natives of Metabeland, a Hottentot named Hans, who had once been the slave of a Transvaal boar, and a Zulu hunter, who for five years had accompanied me on my trips, and whose name was Mashun. Now near Gatgara I found a piece of healthy, park-like country, where the grass was very good, considering the time of year, and here I made a little camp or headquarter settlement, from whence I went expeditions on all sides in search of game, especially elephant. My luck, however, was bad. I got but little ivory. I was therefore very glad when some natives brought me news that a large herd of elephants were feeding in a valley about thirty miles away. At first I thought of trekking down to the valley, wagon and all, but gave up the idea on hearing that it was infested with the deadly testy fly, which is certain death to all animals except men, donkeys, and wild game. So I reluctantly determined to leave the wagon in the charge of Metabel, leader and driver, and to start on a trip into the thorn country, accompanied only by the Hottentot hands and Meshun. Accordingly, on the following morning we started, and on the evening of the next day reached the spot where the elephants were reported to be. But here again we were met by ill luck. That the elephants had been there was evident enough, for their spoor was plentiful, and so were other traces of their presence in the shape of mimoso trees torn out of the ground and placed topsy-turvy on their flat crowns in order to enable the great beasts to feast on their sweet roots. 
but the elephants themselves were conspicuous by their absence. They had elected to move on. This being so, there was only one thing to do, and that was to move after them, which we did, and a pretty hunt they led us. For a fortnight or more we dodged about after those elephants, coming up with them on two occasions, and a splendid herd they were, only, however, to lose them again. At length we came up with them a third time, and I managed to shoot one bull, and then they started off again, where it was useless to try and follow them. After this I gave it up in disgust, and we made the best of our way back to the camp, not in the sweetest of tempers, carrying the tusks of the elephant I had shot. It was on the afternoon of the fifth day of our tramp that we reached the little kopje overlooking the spot where the wagon stood, and I confess that I climbed it with a pleasurable sense of homecoming, for his wagon is the hunter's home, as much as his house is that of the civilized person. I reached the top of the kopi, and looking in the direction where the friendly white tent of the wagon should be, but there was no wagon, only a black burnt plain, stretching away as far as the eye could reach. I rubbed my eyes, looked again, and made out on the spot of the camp, not my wagon, but some charred beams of wood, half wild with grief and anxiety, followed by hands and machoon, I ran at full speed down the slope of the kopi and across the space of the plain below the spring of water where my camp had been. I was soon there, only to find my worst suspicions were confirmed. The wagon and all its contents, including my spare guns and ammunition, had been destroyed by a grass-fire. Now before I started I had left orders with the driver to burn off the grass around the camp in order to guard against accidents of this nature, and here was the reward of my folly a very proper illustration of the necessity, especially where natives are concerned, of doing a thing oneself if one wants it done at all. Evidently the lazy rascals had not burnt around the wagon. Most probably, indeed, they had themselves carelessly fired the tall and resinous tambuki grass nearby. The wind had driven the flames on to the wagon tent, and there was quickly an end of the matter. As for the driver and leader, I know not what became of them. Probably fearing my anger, they bolted, taking the oxen with them. I have never seen them from that hour to this. I sat down on the black veldt by the spring, and gazed at the charred axles and disselboom of my wagon, and I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, I felt inclined to weep. As for Mashoon and Hans, they cursed away vigorously, one in Zulu and the other in Dutch. Ours was a pretty position. We were nearly three hundred miles away from Bemaguato, the capital of Kama's country, which was the nearest spot where we could get any help, and our ammunition, spare guns, clothing, food, and everything else were all totally destroyed. I had just what I stood in, which was a flannel shirt, a pair of belt schoons or shoes of rawhide, my eight-bore rifle, and a few cartridges. Hands and Mashoon also each had a martini rifle and some cartridges, not many. And it was with this equipment that we had to undertake a journey of three hundred miles through a desolate and almost uninhabitable region. I can assure you that I have rarely been in a worse position, and I have been in some queer ones. However, these things are the natural incidents of a hunter's life, and the only thing to do was to make the best of them. Accordingly, after passing a comfortless night by the remains of my wagon, we started next morning on a long journey toward civilization. Now, if we were to set work to tell you all the troubles and incidents of that dreadful journey, I should keep you listening here till midnight, so I will, with your permission, pass on to the particular adventure of which the pair of buffalo horns opposite are the melancholy memento. We had been travelling for about a month, living and getting along as best we could, when one evening we camped some forty miles from Bemaguato. By this time we were indeed in a melancholy plight, foot-sore, half-starved, and utterly worn out, and in addition I was suffering from a sharp attack of fever, which half-blinded me and made me weak as a babe. Our ammunition, too, was exhausted. 
I had only one cartridge left for my eight-bore rifle, and Hans and Machoon, who were armed with Martini Henrys, had three between them. It was about an hour from sundown when we halted and lit a fire, for luckily we still had a few matches. It was a charming spot to camp, I remember. Just off the game track we were following was a little hollow, fringed about with flat-crowned mimosa trees, and at the bottom of the hollow a spring of clear water welled up out of the earth and formed a pool, round the edges of which grew an abundance of watercress, of an exactly similar kind to those which were handed round the table just now. Now we had no food of any kind left, having that morning devoured the last remains of a little orib antelope, which I had shot two days previously. Accordingly, Hans, who was a better shot than Machoon, took two of the remaining martini cartridges and started out to see if he could not kill a buck for supper. I was too weak to go out myself. Meanwhile, Machoon employed himself in dragging together some dead boughs from the mimosa tree to make a sort of skirm, or shelter for us to sleep in, about forty yards from the edge of the pool of water. We had been greatly troubled with lions in the course of our long tramp, and only on the previous night have very nearly been attacked by them, which made me nervous, especially in my weak state. Just as we had finished the skirm, or rather something which did duty for one, Masoon and I heard a shot apparently fired about a mile away. "'Hark to it!' sung out Masoon in Zulu, more, I fancy, by way of keeping his spirits up than for any other reason, for he was a sort of black Mark Tapley, and very cheerful under difficulties. Hark to the wonderful sound with which the Mabuna, the Boers, shook our fathers to the ground at the Battle of the Blood River. We are hungry now, my father, our stomachs are small and withered up like a dry ox's paunch, but they will soon be full of good meat. Hands is a Hottentot, and an Umphagozan, that is, a long fellow. But he shoots straight, ah! He certainly shoots straight. Be of good heart, my father. There will soon be meat upon the fire, and we shall rise up men. And so he went on talking nonsense till I told him to stop, because he made my head ache with his empty words. Shortly after we heard the shot, the sun sank in his red splendor, and there fell upon the earth and sky the great hush of the African wilderness. The lions were not up as yet. They would probably wait for the moon and the birds and beasts were all at rest. I could not describe the intensity of the quiet of the night, to me in my weak state, and fretting as I was over the non-return of the Hottentot hands. It seemed almost ominous, as though nature were brooding over some tragedy which was being enacted in her sight. It was quiet, quiet as death, and lonely as the grave. Mashoon, I said at last, where is Hans? My heart is heavy for him. Nay, my father, I know not. Mayhap he is weary, and sleeps, or mayhap he has lost his way. Mashoon, art thou a boy to talk folly to me? I answered. Tell me, in all the years thou hast hunted by my side, didst thou ever know a Hottentot to lose his path, or to sleep upon the way to camp? Nay, Makumazan, that, ladies, is my native name and means the man who gets up by night, or who is always awake. I know not where he is. But though we talked thus, we neither of us liked to hint at what was both in our minds, namely that misfortune had overtaken the poor Hottentot. Mashoon, I said at last, go down to the water, and bring me of those green herbs that grow there. I am hungered, and must eat something." Nay, my father, surely the ghosts are there. They come out of the water at night and sit upon the banks to dry themselves. An Isanusi, that is, witch-finder, told me. Mashoon was, I think, one of the bravest men I ever knew in the daytime, but he had a more than civilized dread of the supernatural. Must I go myself, thou fool? I said sternly. Nay, Makumazan, if thy heart yearns for strange things like a sick woman, I go, even if the ghosts devour me. And accordingly he went, and soon returned with a large bundle of watercress, of which I ate greedily. Art thou not hungry? I asked the great Zulu presently, as he sat eyeing me eating. Never was I hungrier, my father. Then eat, and I pointed to the watercress. Nay, Makumazan, 
I cannot eat those herbs. If thou dost not eat, thou wilt starve. Eat, Mashuni. He stared at the watercress doubtfully for a while, and at last seized a handful and crammed them into his mouth, crying out as he did so, Oh, why was I born that I should live to feed on green weeds like an ox? Surely if my mother could have known it, she would have killed me when I was born. And so he went on lamenting between each fistful of watercrest till all were finished, when he declared that he was full indeed of stuff. But it lay very cold on his stomach, like snow upon a mountain. At any other time I should have laughed, for it must be admitted he had a ludicrous way of putting things. Zulus do not like green food. Just after Mashoon had finished his watercress, we heard the loud woof, woof of a lion, who was evidently promenading much nearer to our little skirm than was pleasant. Indeed, on looking into the darkness and listening intently, I could hear his snoring breath and catch the light of his green-yellow eyes. We shouted loudly, and Mashoon threw some sticks on the fire to frighten him, which apparently had the desired effect, for we saw no more of him for a while. Just after we had this fright from the lion, the moon rose in her fullest splendor, throwing a robe of silver light all over the earth. I have rarely seen a more beautiful moonrise. I remember that sitting in the skirm I could with ease read faint pencil notes in my pocket-book. As soon as the moon was up, game began to trek down to the water just below us. I could, from where I sat, see all sorts of them passing along the little ridge that ran to our right, on their way to the drinking place. Indeed, one buck, a large eland, came within twenty yards of the skirm, and I stood at gaze, staring at it suspiciously, his beautiful head and twisted horns standing out clearly against the sky. I had, I recollect, every mind to have a pull at him on the chance of providing ourselves with a good supply of beef. But remembering that we had but two cartridges left, and the extreme uncertainty of a shot by moonlight, I at length decided to refrain. The eland presently moved on to the water, and a minute or two afterwards there arose a great sound of splashing, followed by the quick fall of galloping hoofs. "'What's that, Mashun?' I asked." "'That damn lion! Buck smell him!' replied the Zulu in English, of which he had a very superficial knowledge. Scarcely were the words out of his mouth before we heard a sort of whine over the other side of the pool, which was instantly answered by a loud coughing roar close to us. "'By Jove!' I said. "'There are two of them. They have lost the buck. We must look out. They don't catch us.' And again we made up the fire and shouted, with the result that the lions moved off. Mashun, I said, do you watch till the moon gets over that tree, when it will be in the middle of the night, then wake me. Watch well now, or the lions will be picking those worthless bones of yours before you are three hours older. I must rest a little, or I shall die. Course, chief, answered the Zulu. Sleep, my father, sleep in peace. My eyes shall be open as the stars, and like the stars watch over you. Although I was so weak, I could not at once follow his advice. To begin with, my head ached with fever, and I was torn with anxiety as to the fate of the Hottentot hands, and indeed as to our own fate, left with sore feet, empty stomachs, and two cartridges, to find a way to Bamagwata, forty miles off. Then the mere sensation of knowing that there are one or more hungry lions prowling around you somewhere in the dark is disquieting, however well one may be used to it and, by keeping the attention on the stretch, tends to prevent one from sleeping. In addition to all these troubles, too, I was, I remember, seized with a dreadful longing for a pipe of tobacco, whereas, under the circumstances, I might as well have longed for the moon. At last, however, I fell into an uneasy sleep as full of bad dreams as a prickly pear is of points, one of which I recollect was that I was setting my naked foot upon a cobra, which rose upon its tail and hissed my name, Makumazan, into my ear. Indeed, the cobra hissed with such persistency that at last I roused myself. Makumazan! Nazia! Nazia! There, there, whispered Mashun's voice into my drowsy ear. Raising myself, I opened my eyes, and I saw Mashun kneeling by my side, pointing towards the water. Following the line of his outstretched hand, my eyes fell upon a sight that made me jump. Old hunter as I was, even in those days. 
About twenty paces from the little skirm was a large ant-heap, and on the summit of the ant-heap, her forefeet rather close together so as to find standing space, stood the massive form of a big lioness. Her head was towards the skirm, and in the bright moonlight I saw her lower it and lick her paws. Mashum thrust the martini rifle into my hands, whispering that it was loaded. I lifted it and covered the lioness, but found that even in that light I could not make out the foresight of the martini. As it would have been madness to fire without doing so, for the result would probably be that I should wound the lioness if indeed I did not miss her altogether, I lowered the rifle, and hastily tearing a fragment of paper from one of the leaves of my pocket-book which I had been consulting just before I went to sleep. I proceeded to fix it on to the front sight. But all this took a little time, and before the paper was satisfactorily arranged, Mashum again gripped me by the arm and pointed to the dark heap under the shade of a small mimosa tree which grew not more than ten paces from the skirm. "'Well, what is it?' I whispered. "'I can see nothing.' "'It's another lion,' he answered. "'Nonsense! Thy heart is dead with fear, thou seest double.' and I bent forward over the edge of the surrounding fence and stared at the heap. Even as I said the words, the dark mass rose and stalked out into the moonlight. It was a magnificent black-maned lion, one of the largest I had ever seen. When he had gone two or three steps, he caught the sight of me, halted, and there stood gazing straight towards us. He was so close that I could see the firelight reflected in his wicked greenish eyes. "'Shoot! Shoot!' said Mashoon. "'The devil is coming. He is going to spring.' I raised the rifle, and got the bit of paper on the foresight, straight on to a little path of white hair, just where the throat is set into the chest and shoulders. As I did so, the lion glanced back over his shoulder, as, according to my experience, a lion nearly always does before he springs. Then he dropped his body a little and I saw his big paws spread out upon the ground as he put his weight upon them to gather purchase. In haste I pressed the trigger of the martini, and not a moment too soon, for as I did so he was in the act of springing. The report of the rifle rang out sharp and clear on the intense silence of the night, and in another second the great brute had landed on his head within four feet of us, rolling over and over towards us was sending the brushes which composed our little fence flying with convulsive strokes of his great paws. We sprang out of the other side of the skirm, and he rolled on to it and into it, and then right through the fire. Next he raised himself and sat upon his haunches like a great dog, and began to roar. Heavens, how he roared! I never heard anything like it before or since. He kept filling his lungs with air, and then emitting it in the most heart-shaking volumes of sound. Suddenly, in the middle of one of the loudest roars, he rolled over onto his side and lay still, and I knew that he was dead. A lion generally dies upon his side. With a sigh of relief, I looked up towards his mate upon the ant-heap. She was standing there, apparently petrified with astonishment, looking over her shoulder and lashing her tail. But to our intense joy, when the dying beast ceased roaring, she turned, and with one enormous bound, vanished into the night. Then we advanced cautiously towards the prostrate brute, Mashoon droning an improvised Zulu song as he went, about how Makumazan, the hunter of hunters, whose eyes are open by night as well as by day, put his hand down the lion's stomach when it came to devour him, and pulled out his heart by the roots, etc., etc., by way of expressing his satisfaction in his hyperbolical Zulu way at the turn events had taken. There was no need for caution. The lion was as dead as though he had already been stuffed with straw. The martini bullet had entered within an inch of the white spot I had aimed at, and travelled right through him, passing out at the right buttock near the root of the tail. The martini has wonderful driving power— though the shock it gives to the system, comparatively speaking, slight, owing to the smallness of the hole it makes. But fortunately the lion is an easy beast to kill. I passed the rest of that night in a profound slumber, my head reposing upon the deceased lion's flank, a position that had, I thought, a beautiful touch of irony about it, though the smell of his singed hair was disagreeable. 
When I woke again, the faint primrose lights of dawn were flushing in the eastern sky. For a moment I could not understand the chill sense of anxiety that lay like a lump of ice at my heart, till the feel and smell of the skin of the dead lion beneath my head recalled the circumstances in which we were placed. I rose, and eagerly looked round to see if I could discover any sign of Hans, who, if he had escaped accident, would surely return to us at dawn. But there was none. Then hope grew faint, and I felt that it was not well with the poor fellow. Setting Mashoon to build up the fire, I hastily removed the hide from the flank of the lion, which was indeed a splendid beast, and cutting off some lumps of flesh, we toasted and ate them greedily. Lion's flesh, strange as it may seem, is very good eating, and tastes more like veal than anything else. By the time we had finished our much-needed meal, the sun was getting up, and after a drink of water and a wash at the pool, we started to try and find Hans, leaving the dead lion to the tender mercies of the hyenas. Both Mashoon and myself were, by constant practice, pretty good hands at tracking, and we had not much difficulty in following the Hottentot spore, faint as it was. We had gone in this way for half an hour or so, and were perhaps a mile or more from the site of our camping place, when we discovered the spoor of a solitary bull buffalo mixed up with the spoor of Hans, and we were able, from various indications, to make out that he had been tracking the buffalo. At length we reached a little glade in which there grew a stunted old mimosa thorn, with a peculiar and overhanging formation of root, under which a porcupine or ant-bear, or some such animal, had hollowed out a wide-lipped hole, about ten or fifteen paces from this thorn tree, there was a thick patch of bush. See, Macumazahn, see," said Mashoon excitedly as we drew near the thorn. "The buffalo has charged him. Look, here he stood to fire at him. See how firmly he planted his feet upon the earth. There is the mark of his crooked toe. Hans had one bent toe. Look, here the bull came like a boulder down the hill, his hoofs turning up the earth like a hoe. Hans had hit him. He bled as he came. There are the blood spots. It is all written down there, my father, there upon the earth. Yes, I said. Yes, but where is Hans? Even as I said it, Mashoon clutched my arm and pointed to the stunted thorn just by us. Even now, gentlemen, it makes me feel sick when I think of what I saw. For fixed in a stout fork of the tree, some eight feet from the ground, was Hans himself, or rather his dead body, evidently tossed there by the furious buffalo. One leg was twisted round the fork, probably in a dying convulsion. In the side, just beneath the ribs, was a great hole from which the entrails protruded. But this was not all. The other leg hung down to within five feet of the ground. The skin and most of the flesh were gone from it. For a moment we stood aghast and gazed at this horrifying sight. Then I understood what had happened. The buffalo, with that devilish cruelty which distinguishes the animal, had, after his enemy was dead, stood underneath his body and licked the flesh off the pendant leg with his file-like tongue. I had heard of such a thing before, but had always treated the stories as hunter's yarns, but I had no doubt about it now. Poor Hans's skeleton foot and ankle were ample proof. We stood aghast under the tree, and stared and stared at this awful sight, when suddenly our cogitations were interrupted in a painful manner. The thick bush, about fifteen paces off, burst asunder with a crashing sound, and uttering a series of ferocious pig-like grunts, the bull buffalo himself came charging out straight at us. Even as he came, I saw the blood mark on his side where poor Hans's bullet had struck him, and also, as is often the case with particularly savage buffaloes, that his flanks had recently been terribly torn in an encounter with a lion. On he came, his head welled up. A buffalo does not generally lower his head till he does so to strike. Those great black horns, as I look at them before me, gentlemen, I seem to see them coming charging at me as I did ten years ago, silhouetted against the green bush behind. On, on. With a shout, Mashoon bolted off sideways towards the bush. I had instinctively lifted my eight-bore, which I had in my hand. It would have been useless to fire at the buffalo's head, for the dense horns must have turned the bullet, but as Mashoon bolted, the bull slew a little, 
with the momentary idea of following him, and this gave me a ghost of a chance. I let drive my only cartridge at his shoulder. The bullet struck the shoulder blade and smashed it up, and then travelled under the skin into his flank, but it did not stop him, though for a second he staggered. Throwing myself onto the ground with the energy of despair, I rolled under the shelter of the projecting root of the thorn, crushing myself as far into the mouth of the ant-bear hole as I could. In a single instant the buffalo was after me, kneeling down on his uninjured knee, for one leg, that of which I had broken the shoulder, was swinging helplessly to and fro. He set to work to try and hook me out of the hole with his crooked horn. At first he struck at me furiously, and it was one of the blows against the base of the tree which splintered the tip of the horn in the way that you see. Then he grew more cunning, and pushed his head as far under the root as possible, made a long semi-circular sweep at me, grunting furiously, and blowing saliva and hot steamy breath all over me. I was just out of reach of the horn, though every stroke, by widening the hole and making more room for his head, brought it closer to me. But every now and again I received heavy blows in the ribs from his muzzle, Feeling that I was being knocked silly, I made an effort, and seizing his rough tongue, which was hanging from his jaws, I twisted it with all my force. The great brute bellowed with pain and fury, and jerked himself backwards so strongly that he dragged me some inches further from the mouth of the hole, and again made a sweep at me, catching me this time around the shoulder joint in the hook of his horn. I felt that it was all up now, and began to hola. "'He has got me!' I shouted in mortal terror. "'Gwasa! Machoon! Gwasa! "'Stab, Machoon! Stab!' "'One hoist of the great head, and out of the hole I came like a periwinkle out of his shell. "'But even as I did so, I caught the sight of Machoon's stalwart form advancing with his bagwan, "'or broad stabbing assegai, raised above his head. "'In another quarter of a second I had fallen from the horn, and heard the blow of the spear.' followed by the indescribable sound of steel shearing its way through flesh. I had fallen on my back, and, looking up, I saw that the gallant machoon had driven the assegai a foot or more into the carcass of the buffalo, and was turning to fly. Alas! it was too late. Bellowing madly, and spouting blood from mouth and nostrils, the devilish brute was on him, and had thrown him up like a feather and then gored him twice as he lay. I struggled up with some wild idea of affording help. But before I had gone a step, the buffalo gave one long, sighing bellow, and rolled over dead by the side of his victim. Machoon was still living, but a single glance at him told me that his hour had come. The buffalo's horn had driven a great hole in his right lung, and inflicted other injuries. I knelt down beside him in the uttermost distress, and took his hand. "'Is he dead, Macumazahn?' he whispered. "'My eyes are blind. I cannot see. "'Yes, he is dead. "'Did the black devil hurt thee, Macumazahn? "'No, my poor fellow, I am not hurt much. "'Oh, I am glad.' "'Then came a long silence, broken only by the sound of the air "'whistling through the hole in his lungs as he breathed. "'Macumazahn, art thou there? "'I cannot feel thee. "'I am here, Mashun. "'I die, Macumazahn. "'The world flies round and round. "'I go. "'I go out into the dark. "'Surely, my father, "'at times in days to come "'thou wilt think of me, Mashun, "'who stood by thy side, "'when thou killest elephants "'as we used, as we used. They were his last words. His brave spirit passed with him. I dragged his body to the hole under the tree, and pushed it in, placing his broad assegai by him, according to the customs of his people, that he might not go defenceless on his long journey. And then, ladies, I am not ashamed to confess, I stood alone there, before it, and wept like a woman. End of Hunter Quartermain's Story by H. Ryder Haggard